Um, welcome to the first huddle of the uh, PNG FFRG National Project. Um, this is really your guys' chance to get some awesome feedback one-on-one -on -one from um, the national team and Aileen um, before we go into the next call, which is a crit. Um, we sort of have this difference between what we call huddles, which is just the national team and Aileen and you guys, and then the crits um, are a little bit more formal, um, if we want to call it that, with the PNG team and the FFRG team. Um, we wanted to call it something different, just so you're a little bit aware of the different audience that you're presenting to. Uh, so this is your chance to get some one-on-one -on -one feedback just from us, the design folks, uh, before you present to our sponsors next time. Um, we loved reviewing all of your uh, all of your slides this morning. It was really, really fun. You guys uh, made some awesome progress on Identify and Immerse. Um, so we're excited to hear you guys walk through that in your own words yourselves um, and get you set up to start thinking about Reframe in the next week and a half before the next crit. Um, so I sent out um, an email earlier with the order that we're going to be presenting in. Um, this call is basically structured like pre presentation feedback, presentation feedback, um, and then we'll wrap it up at the end by talking um, a little bit about what's going to what's going to happen in Reframe and some resources we have for you. Um, so we're going to go in the order of uh, Purdue's going to kick us off, and then Yale is going to follow Purdue. Uh, Rensselaer is going to follow Yale. Case CIA is going to follow Rensselaer, um, and then Texas State is going to round us out at the end. So again, that order is Purdue, Yale, Rensselaer, uh, Crew CIA, and Texas State. It's the same order that's in the notes doc as well. Um, and you guys are going to have four minutes to present. So Purdue, um, Jesse, if you could get your slides pulled up and ready to present, we will um, get going as soon as you're ready. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Can you guys see my screen? Yeah, we can. Yeah, we can. Um, so hi everyone, my name is Jesse. Hi, I'm the team Jesse. for DFA Produce team. Um, so to get started, we looked into several articles and research links that were focused on reduction and grocery stores, which led us to look into facility reports and how policies are how policies are um, We are able to get a report from Target report from Target from Target taking place in our community, such as recycling kiosks, and all the plastic bags and products are made of 40% recycled content. We also looked into articles about how recycling is executed in our city. Currently, people are very active and knowledgeable about the recycling drop-off center. Anything can be recycled in curbside recycling bins, including plastic film. Because Lafayette takes an extra step to separate everything by hand to avoid tipping fees at the landfills. Um, um, and after talking with the government, the commission, they pointed us in the direction of grocery stores because there is only an emphasis on plastic bag recycling as opposed to the entirety of plastic film food and household product packaging. Um, so moving on, we talked about a representative to understand the sustainability effort since they do not offer plastic bags. And we talked to Emily Tapaldo from FRG to get a deeper understanding of consumer expectations of products. Um, so, in our secondary research, we separated our efforts and research in two areas. Um, the front end of the store, which is the first half handling statement, and the back end, which is the second half handling statement. And the goal for this was to learn about how many areas where we can make the most impact. Um, we developed research questions to help us get started. The key takeaways from the back end of the store was that policies are consumer focused on topics such as single use plastic and grocery store work. We don't have that time to make based decisions unless they're required to. Um, and on the front end, there was more, more, more in regards to human behavior, where people will come up with excuses to justify the use of plastic bags, bags along with buying prepackaged items within a large packet, within a larger package because of convenience. So if you think about like the Russian dollars world, but with packaging. Um, but overall, we came to the conclusion that upper management stores were best suited to change corporate policy, which allowed us to focus our efforts on the deeper to uh, our first how can we say my detailed research. Um, so with these interviews, we wanted to understand the user's thought process and actions when it comes to grocery shopping, shopping, buying household items, and recycling in general. 
Um, we chose to interview chose users to who grew up in Latvia or have lived here for most of their life. Um, so to start off, Debbie emphasized the fact that she wouldn't give up certain conveniences. In order hey, to Jesse. I'm going to stop you for a second. Sophie, would you mind uh, like re-muting yourself, turning it off and on again? I think there's some echo coming from your computer okay, for some reason. Yeah. I'll try that. Okay. Jesse, would you mind testing it out, talking, seeing if it's yeah. still echoing? No, it doesn't echo. So it's all good. Um, so I think it's a little bit better. OK. All right, sorry to interrupt you. You were on a great flow. Oh, don't worry about it. Um, so going back, uh, Debbie emphasized the fact that she wouldn't give up during conveniences um, in order to recycle. And what sets her up to have a successful trip is to make a list of what she needs to buy ahead of time. Um, Scotland, on the other hand, is more about spending the least amount of time in the grocery store and tends to buy things that are packaged in bulk. Um, Raymond's fullest extent of recycling is to reuse the grocery classic bags as garbage bags or picking up after his dog. Um, but besides that, he wouldn't really do anything more unless it was streamed on in his day to day. Um, Piper tries and wants to become more self conscious about using reusable bags, but when she realized that she forgot them in it, when she realized that she forgot them in her car, it's not really worth the effort for her to go back and get them. Um, and of, out of all the interviews, Adam is the most conscious about buying products with the least amount of packaging. Um, when he's in the produce section where he buys most of his groceries, he doesn't bother with using produce bags because he's going to end up putting them in a plastic or paper bag at the cashier. Um, so personally, I, I never thought of that. And I use produce bags out of habit because my mom did. Um, and when we started doing observational research, there were a few people that we saw that also did the same thing, putting uncovered fruits and vegetables directly in their carts. And another key takeaway was that there are just many household products that had a second layer of packaging. So this was representing to the Russian doll approach I had mentioned earlier. Um, but overall, our interviews led us to two main key insights. Um, people approach recycling like it's a favor they are doing to our society, rather than feeling that recycling is an obligation or a duty to contribute to keeping the community sustainable. Um, and that people value convenience, time, and minimum effort, which pushes the priority of being self-conscious about recycling plastic film at the bottom of their priority list when grocery shopping. And for our next steps, we're, go we're gonna follow up with our users um, to address what common food items and products are being bought on a regular basis to see if there are opportunities there. Um, we're also gonna reach out to Target again and pay less to understand or start layout and start behavioral mapping um, to establish shopping patterns. Um, and so something we want to do individually is we'd like to try making a grocery list ahead of time um, and documenting our shopping process when we're at the store. Um, the catch is that we would avoid anything that had plastic film um, to see how hard it is to shop and to pinpoint where buying products with plastic film cannot be avoided, especially if it's something that's highly needed. Um, so overall, we we mainly just want we mainly want feedback about what we should be looking for um, when people go on grocery trips. Grocery trips that I haven't mentioned already, um, and just like any tips on reaching out to stores and getting permission, um, we've just been having trouble like getting access to like people who will allow us to give us permission because every time we call um, the managers of the stores, they keep on leading us to they keep on sending us to different people and then eventually up to headquarters, and then it takes a long time to approve it. Um, the only store who was actually responsive was Target, but they were only able to let us, let us do observational research, but we did, they, didn't want a lot of, they didn't want us to stop their customers and take pictures of them while they were shopping. Um, so that's just kind of an obstacle we've been, we've been having. That's it. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Jesse. Um, I think one to address that specific question about um, getting permission, um, mm -hmm. and I, I feel like a lot of teams uh, have. <coughs> how do we talk to people? Um, to a certain extent, you do need to ask permission for certain things, but um, at the same time, um, don't ask questions that you don't necessarily want the answer to. Is my big piece of advice for uh, observational research. Anyone can go into a store and take pictures in a store, so don't worry about. <laughs> observational research where you're just a picking up items and taking pictures of them, looking at uh, Sharon. Oh, I think we're good. 
Um, so don't worry so much about um, asking for permission for absolutely everything. Um, if you, of course, if you're going up to a store manager and saying, hey, can we really scrutinize your store and take pictures of everything? Um, you're probably not gonna get the answer that you want. Um, of course, don't try, try to avoid doing things that are going to sort of be a red flag for managers. Uh, mm -hmm. Don't go up and totally interrupt a consumer's experience or interrupt their day or do something that they're gonna wanna um, escalate to a manager level. Okay. Um, my other thoughts are like, great job at synthesizing your user research as you go. Um, you did a great job of um, really creating uh, creating a divide between uh, those two how can we statements, which I think are both, you've identified a lot of cool opportunity spaces between them, but sort of filtering your user research into those how can we statements, applying slap stats to them and really giving us a sense of what insights you uh, and user research you want to use moving forward within those two how can we statements. I think user journeys are gonna be really, really important for you guys as you move through synthesis. Mm -hmm. You're really thinking about that user journey, whether it's the consumer or the user journey of the store worker. Um, and I think those are gonna be super important. Um, other thoughts from Ross or Aileen or any of the teams? Curious to hear your thoughts. Um, I will, this is Aileen. I would say um, that you did also that you have done a great job. Um, and, and it was really easy for me to follow along what what you were doing and to understand the research so far. Um, I would agree about, it is legal. I just did a quick Google search while you were talking to take pictures inside a store unless a manager asked you not to. Yeah. So um, so please. I think you're, you just, if they come up to you and say, please stop and obviously stop. Um, I, I was also, worried, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, we got worried because when we were at Payless, we were doing it. We were just kind of standing around near the pretty section and it, we kind of look suspicious, but they, the manager did ask us to leave, and then we got worried, and then we tried to like contact other stores so we wouldn't like have that happen again. Um, but yeah, it, it makes sense. Yeah, I mean, you make, and also if you're taking pictures of people mm -hmm. who are grocery shopping, then I think I would ask their specific permission. Say we're doing the school project on, you know, on the on recycling, and we're wondering if we could, you know, you don't need to photograph them, but if we could photograph your cart or something like that. Okay. Um, and then um, I also wonder, you're in the immerse phase, so I, I'm, this is not the problem solving phase, but I wondered if anybody um, were offered an option <laughs> to the plastic bags in the, in the produce section, if they would have used them, like a mesh produce bag um, on site. So, but, but again, I, I, that, that, I don't want to jump ahead. What I really actually loved about your, your presentation was how you didn't jump ahead and how immersive it was. So I, you know, that, that's what kind of got me thinking, oh, okay, this is what's happening. I wonder, you know, I wonder what options there are for this. That's exactly really what you're not supposed to be doing. So thank you for not doing that and sorry that I am, but that's how much I was inspired <laughs> by your presentation. Thank you. <laughs> Good job. Thank you. Aileen, we did the exact same thing over here. We had the same idea of, yeah. of offering up the reusable produce bags and <laughs> the same thing. Let's go ahead, but. <laughs> yeah. Other final thoughts before we move on to Yale? Can I ask one question? Yes. Yes, go ahead. Hey, Jesse. Um, really nice, as everyone was saying, and really clear. I'm wondering about um, if there's any next steps that you guys are thinking about for considering not just what's happening at that moment in the grocery store and how people are making their shopping decisions, but sort of other kinds of plastic stuff and where that might fit into their world. At home, etc. Um, I think one thing that Packer mentioned was like before going to the store and having kind of like looking into their their planning trip and how they plan for to go to the grocery grocery store um because i know that she, in our interview she kind of mentioned about it's like having reminders before actually going to the grocery store that's somewhere in our car or that's somewhere that's in our house before she leaves so that way she knows to bring reusable bags that way she knows to bring these things to you so that way she wouldn't have to get plastic film there um but that's one thing we definitely want to look into more Ruby, thanks. 
Um, I actually have one more thing to add, which is because I know that that um, in our previous uh, meetings, the emphasis was from the recycling group was was really on recycling. Um, um, and so I'm wondering if I'm wondering if in in relation to Rebecca, Rebecca, Rebecca sorry, I hear myself echoing myself. myself. Um, if, if there's a possibility of asking people if if there's something at home that they could do at home that would encourage them to recycle those bags too, you know, when they're home, if they could, like for me, I get those produce bags all the time, and um. I feel like if I had a specific place to put them, <laughs> something to do with them, I'd be more inclined to then bring them back. All right, thank you guys. Uh, Sophie, go ahead. Or Sharon. All right. Uh, hey, am I on mute now? Sorry, I've never used blue jeans before. Yeah, also, yeah, you're can people hear me? <laughs> All right, awesome. I'll yes. share my screen. Yeah. Wait, can people hear me? Yeah. Okay, okay. Just wondering. <laughs> Hi. All right, great. So, um, can you guys see my screen? <clears throat> is this visible? Yeah, we're yeah, it is. Yeah. All right, yeah. fantastic. So, we are DFA Yale, and um, of course, we are in the Identify and Immerse stage. And just a quick recap, our how can we statement is how can we make plastic film recycling more convenient to food vendors and consumers in the marketplace. And we especially wanted to focus on less traditional plastic films. So aside from plastic bags, we're also interested in produce bags or um, food wrappings, especially because um, Connecticut recently passed a 10 cent um, tax on plastic bags. So we're wondering if there are other forms of plastic that haven't been taxed but are still plastic film um, uh, things that could be recycled. So um, essentially, um, throughout our week, we conducted um, a lot of research online, um, a lot of articles about what has been done already in terms of reducing plastic waste and um, improving recycling. And I think one of the most interesting things I read was this um, paper by Closed Loop Partners. That was kind of like a review of um, plastic film recycling in 2017. And one of the most interesting things that I saw there was that there are no existing initiatives to educate people on what can be recycled, nor are there many existing incentives for recycling. And also, uh, there are so many plastic um, flexible films uh, used throughout, uh, like in terms of food packaging, but a lot of this isn't recyclable at all. And this is something that a lot of people just don't really know about. But in terms of um, traditional plastic film, um, about like 1,500 plastic bags are used by American families every year. And like a very, very small portion of that is actually recycled. So this was something that we really wanted to focus on, just basically like incentivizing recycling. Um, this was something that was um, something that was also kind of um, echoed during our interviews with um, stakeholders. So our meeting one. Um, during our first meeting, we kind of went into like the brainstorming session. Um, so, so essentially what happened was that we kind of tried to brainstorm uh, answers to how stakeholders are affected by plastic film. So this was a lot of, um, this was built on a lot of assumptions before we actually went into the interview phase. So um, we kind of, through the research that we did, um, one of the main things that we all talked about was that plastic film, um, this is something that lowers the quality of life for local residents, and this is something that do affect the residents, but sometimes pretty indirectly. So this is something that people aren't really incentivized to actually care about. Mm -hmm. um, and, but this is something that is very difficult for the community as a whole, for policymakers and for recyclers, because they make recycling workers' jobs more difficult and they, um, the process of recycling plastic film that is uh, disposed improperly takes a lot of time and effort. So this is current outreach that has been done um, that we have found so far from, I think, the PlasticFilmRecycling.org website. So as you can see, um, it is, it's slightly, it's pretty like user friendly, but one of the issues about it is that in order for someone to actually get access to this, they're going to actually be, they actually need to get on the website itself and then print out this card. And this is something that someone who hasn't really ever thought about plastic film recycling before wouldn't actually do. 
and we also went into a brainstorming section about barriers to plastic film recycling. And some of the things that we mentioned um, were that plastic film recycling, it was very inconvenient to consumers to travel to their nearest collection center. So for us at Yale, um, for instance, our nearest collection center is about five miles away. Um, a lot of people don't know what uh, collection centers are. And um, there's also a lack of information on what can be recycled and what can't be recycled. So in our second meeting, we um, kind of went into our interview phase. So Sharon, do you want to kind of talk about the interviews that you conducted? Yeah, sure. So mostly the interviews that I conducted um, were with like students and um, yeah, I kind of just like to add on with Sophie, um, really emphasized our uh, assumption. Just so you know. Oh, okay, sorry. Yeah, so basically, yeah, they um, didn't really have the motivation to like take an Uber all the way to Walmart to recycle some like, plastic bags. Um, and they also just like weren't really sure what could be recycled. Um, like they would see a bin that would say like they take plastics, but they don't know what kind of plastics. So they just kind of put everything in there. Mm -hmm. I think you want to add? Yeah, that. definitely. Yeah. So a lot of students that we spoke to, like they, they like they were very um, aware of sustainability sustainability efforts, but it was something that didn't really affect them personally. So they weren't really motivated to actually go and recycle the plastic film by themselves, um, even if they knew about the plastic film collection centers, which many of them just did not know about. Um, we actually wanted to conduct an interview at Walmart, um, but unfortunately, we kind of faced like the same kind of issues that Jesse had. Um, we actually have um, an, an interview set up with Walmart, um, the head of customer service, um, and we're actually going to be able to interview some management and perhaps some customers next week. So this is something that we're pretty excited about. But um, in the future, we also would like to contact um, another local grocery store, ShopRite, um, a local recycling center to see kind of like the difficulties that they face and the challenges that food um, clear film presents directly to them, as well as like a local um, sustainability nonprofit to see um, basically what kind of awareness they're spreading about plastic film recycling and just plastic recycling as a whole. Um, so in terms of feedback, we're kind of interested in um, maybe just kind of getting your opinions on how are the answered questions that we have relevant to our how can we statement. And um, also as um, I think we kind of talked about this with the um, with Jesse at Purdue, just like tips to approaching local residents in a casual setting like a grocery store, um, perhaps like even without like the explicit permission of management. Um, and also like are the planned uh, future interviewees and interview questions relevant to addressing our how can we statement. Great, thanks. No, awesome first work with the Immerse in, uh, in identifying and everything and what you've done so far. My, my feedback uh, is geared towards your how can we. Um, as you're entering like reframe, possibly think about how you want to um, narrow down and become a little bit more specific with your how can we statement because it will help you guide and understand the motivation. So my recommendation is to try to identify at least one staker per how can we. Because um, mm -hmm. right now you have two in there, and so you have both consumers and the um, marketplace, I forget what exactly, uh, the vendors. And mm -hmm. the motivations and what they're doing and how they interact with plastic film are a little bit different. And the behaviors that um, they then show uh, are going to be different too. So if you can either just separate them or just take time to focus on each group separately and develop how can we's, uh, the more specific you can be for the user, it'll be just really clarifying so you know who you're trying to uh, address uh, with your design solution. Um, and you can have multiple working simultaneously as you're going through this project, um, but I just think that will be something that helps you move forward. Um, and I also my other challenge to you is possibly you created this really good list of barriers that you've identified. Uh, and I think those are good starting points to then you can reframe and uh, rephrase those into their own individual how can we's. So like one of the barriers is uh, like there's no access. OK, like how can we increase access for consumers uh, on their trip or something like that? So I'd just be interested in seeing you come up with uh, some other how can we's for those and see which one makes mo the most sense or addresses the current umbrella one that you have right now. Uh, Kelly, do you have anything to add? Um, yeah, I think just uh, to specifically address, uh, you know, approaching, approaching people in grocery stores. I don't know how many of you are approaching people 
uh, as groups or um, as individuals, um, you look a lot less suspicious to management and you um, probably are a lot less intimidating to a group of people if you're going up to someone as an individual than you are as a group. Um, you probably have already tried that technique, but I would definitely um, encourage all of you to, to try that if you haven't already. Um, Aileen or other teams, thoughts? Um, I think it, in the grocery store, I think that's true. If you're going to interview people outside in a park or even outside the grocery store, um, I would say a couple things. If you have a DFA T-shirt at all, maybe wear that so that you look somewhat official when you're explaining to people what you do. Um, have a clipboard, you know, so that you, you uh, again, so that you look like you have an official mission instead of just somebody who wants to harass somebody. And I actually, not inside the grocery store, but I actually was going to say the opposite, that, that maybe if you go as a, as a pair to talk to people, that might be less intimidating than if you're just some random person by yourself. I, I can see how inside the grocery store that wouldn't be true because it, you would be calling more attention to yourself. But if you're going to walk up to people in a, in a park setting or something like that, um, then that might be better. And even though everybody, I can see why everybody wants to interview people in the grocery store because that's where it's happening, um, most people go to the grocery store even when they're not in the grocery store. So you, you don't necessarily have to interview people about those habits right there. That's it. Great, thank you. We've got 30 more seconds for thoughts. Hello, everyone. We're passing the mic back and forth just so we're kind of being uh, on top of it, but I also wanted to say or just mention for teams. I know like we uh, have some time. We're trying to get through everybody's. If you guys could take notes to give to everybody, if you don't say your feedback right now, uh, that'd be really beneficial for all the teams. So just be conscious of doing that for the rest of the call, please. And thank you. All right, we've got um, Rensselaer. You are up next. Thanks, Yale. Hello. Hey, we can, can you guys hear me? And see you. Yep. yep. Okay. Awesome. All right. I'm going to give you. I'm going to try to remember to do a one-minute warning warning this time on the timing. Okay, sounds good. Um, I'm Juliana, and today I brought with me Emily and Sarah, who are also working on this project with me. So, <laughs> uh, so I'm going to go through the immerse part of our project. Uh, we really started off the first week looking into articles and research. Um, we really wanted to immerse ourselves in what was happening specifically in Troy, um, as well as looking at the infrastructure of how plastic film is being recycled um, at currently. Uh, so right now, I mentioned last week that Troy is going through a tr transition period where we had a ban passed uh, recently on plastic bags. Um, so we really wanted to look into what is going on right now with with um, recycling plastic film, and then for the future, what is going to happen once plastic bags are banned, and will plastic uh, film recycling be reduced after that, or um, kind of what effects will happen. Um, so from our articles and research, we found a lot of guides and reports and kind of user maps for recycling and sustainability, um, specifically some including Troy, um, inc as well as drop-off locations for recycling film in the area. Um, which included like a 13 mile radius of places where you can go and drop uh, plastic film off, which most of those included grocery stores or large department stores or things like that. Um, from there, we contacted people in our community. So we wanted to try and keep this as uh, broad as possible and try and hit as many pe like types of businesses as we could. Uh, so we spoke to a Transition Troy initiative um, and we asked them kind of what their infrastructure was currently on recycling, um, kind of what next steps will take place once the plastic bag ban is in place as well. Um, we spoke to one of our advisors who is a technical writer and an environmental advocate, um, asking what kind of incentives people need for a cycle and what kind of what part of the consumer loop they think is the most problematic. Um, we also tried to talk to All a right, couple. You guys are halfway through here on your time. Okay. Businesses in downtown Troy, so um, like 
a food establishment, a corner store, an Ace Hardware store. Um, and eventually we reached out to the PTA of a public school in our area, asking what kind of educational practices about recycling are in place as of right now. Um, Um, so before we did our research, we wrote down some objectives that we wanted to get out of out of the research that we were doing, um, and those involved like how the process of recycling, understanding the transportation flow of plastic film, um, awareness versus apathy, um, secondary research um, involving the problem and who's affected by the solution, and then and finally the bag return um, and who who uses them and how do we get more people to use them. Um, some slap stats at the bottom, which we thought were really important, is that only 9% of the billion of tons of plastic produced has ever been recycled, um, and things like that. 7.5% of waste streams consist of plastic films, such as supermarkets. So we tried not to focus on supermarkets and plastic bags alone, but it seemed like that was the place where most of this was happening. Um, so we went to downtown Troy and during the farmer's market and kind of saw what they were doing with their um, recycling during a community type event. Um, something we got out of that is that people like to only recycle for three three different reasons or three main reasons. When it's convenient, when it, they're fearful of like what the future will hold if they don't recycle, and when it's fun. Um, that picture on the left is like a, a fish that was created that people will like throw their plastic water bottles in to you know make it a fun enjoyable experience. Um, next step, since we did focus a little bit on plastic bags mostly during this first part of the Immerse, we want to reach out to other com community members and talk more about plastic film in general. Uh, we want to survey people in our own community and ask how they recycle plastic film, um, speak with our uh, RPI dining program, as well as the sustainability manager at Market Bistro and uh, the recycling coordinator of Troy. And then looking forward to um, some potential feedback. So while we were creating our how can we statement, we kind of came up with a flow of how can we statement. So we feel like the way that this problem is being approached is that first we want to get our community to acknowledge the problem, then we want them to care about it, then educate, take action, and then maintain. Uh, so it's kind of like a flowing how can we that's always changing. Um, and so that first, question evolves from there. Is there a specific place that we should be focusing our efforts when diving deeper into the problem? So like, should we be focusing on like the in-between stage of educating and taking action? Or should we focus on getting people to acknowledge that it's a problem? Um, the second thing on, on outreach, how do people receive information uh, the best about recycling? And then that last one, how do we balance different economic groups that can potentially be affected by the solution? Um, just in general, like solutions have problems that are unintended and we want to try to minimize them as much as possible. Sweet. Thank you, guys. All right. We've got about three minutes for feedback. Uh, I think that was great. I loved uh, your strong primary, primary and secondary research. Seeing that fish photo uh, was great. Um, and I, I loved especially how a lot of that research you're doing actually centers around um, pain points and gain points for your user. Um, but I think it'll help even more. I know that you guys have some stuff planned for the for the future of talking to people. Um, really center on who that user is. Um, user personas are going to be really helpful for you guys, um, and um, and they're going to be really helpful if you're not trying to encompass the entirety of um, all of the research that you've done into one user persona. But if actually, if you can get really specific about who your users are. Are they farmers market goers? Um, who are they? Where are they conducting their actions? Um, and what kind of motivations, hopes, and fears do they have? The more specific you can get into who that, it sounds like you're focusing on the consumer. The more mm -hmm. you can focus on um, getting specific about one or more user personas for that consumer, um, I think the easier it will be to come up with building how can we statements from there. But I really especially loved what you said with those three sort of gain points um, in the middle there of, uh, you know, what, I forget what they are. One of them was making recycling fun. What are the, the three things that sort of need to be in existence to make um, people more motivated to do recycling, which is great. Yeah. One and a half more minutes for feedback. Yeah.
passing the mic again, but I think going off of those three points that you did, like you identified that the motivations that gets people to recycle are convenient or it's because they're fearful of the effects or it's a fun thing to do. Uh, and that's where like having the specified user comes in and you can identify like what makes it convenient for that particular user, what makes it fearful for them, like what are their fears about recycling. And really specifying the user will get you to understand like those three characteristics on a deeper level. I'm, I'm going to do the wrong thing and jump ahead again, but I love that fish thing so much and how um, it encouraged people to recycle. And it made me start thinking about, um, in, in Evanston, we have a lot of um, initiatives that incorporate local artists. And there's also a local business um, association. And it made me start thinking about, um, you know, murals that could, that local artists could do that could talk about recycling and sculptures that could be um, recycling return points. And if local business could, could get, could get involved and have things in their windows. And it, it even though it's, it's better to narrow down right now in the long run. It would be great if it was a community initiative. I loved that fish thing so much. Yeah, at the farmer's market, they also did something with plastic bags and creating like a mural on the on the fencing um, along the river with the plastic yeah, bags. I feel like community, when you can get a community involved, it, it really goes a long way towards educating people. Thanks, that was awesome. Yeah, thank you for the feedback. Sweet. Thanks, you guys. Um, Crew CIA, you're up next. Hello. I'm Audrey. Presentation. All right. So before we, for this week, or before this two weeks. We're having, I don't know if anyone else is, we're having trouble hearing you guys. You're pretty quiet. Um, if you wouldn't mind getting closer to the mic, that would be great. <laughs> so um, before we kind of started these two weeks, we had done a lot of research on um, just plastic film recycling in Cleveland. So what we discovered is that um, there's going to be a ban um, going into effect by next year on plastic bags. So um, we kind of pivoted from focusing on grocery bags to plastic packaging because that's a place um, that has a lot of uh, plastic film um, being wasted. And so we we turn to a high density commercial. Are you guys area. sharing your screen right now? I, I don't know if you're trying to share slides, but we can't see. <laughs> oh, I, oh, shoot. I, okay. Is this it? Can you see it now? Hello? Yeah, yeah perfect. We can see, we can see okay. now. We're following right along. <laughs> okay. Um, All right. <laughs> so, um, so we turn from looking at specifically grocery bags to plastic packaging because we know that there is like a high amount of plastic packaging being used um, right now, and so we thought um, we would look at high density commercial areas. Um, yeah. So. Um, all right, so um, so we looked at um, kind of what's going on in Cleveland and um, what policies have been put in place and found that 95% um, of all recyclables are actually being thrown away, which mm -hmm. is kind of alarming to think that even when things are recycled, um, they're not necessarily um, reused, material isn't. Um, so then looking forward to the future, um, we w would like to figure out um, what the impact of a plastic bag ban will be on Cleveland, um, so we're not really sure like which kind of companies that will affect or if there are certain like stipulations there. And then um, so the goal for this like two weeks is finding more, finding out more about like why there aren't more plastic um, film recycling programs in like high commercial areas because we know that grocery stores already do this kind of stuff. So we wanted to find out more about like what are the barriers to starting this and like how does it actually work and things like that. Um, a few more minutes. Okay, so what we've been doing during these last two weeks is um, taking trips to malls and trying to find out more about these programs. And I also met with someone from the Cuyahoga County Solid Waste District, which is the entity that um, kind of sets guidelines for recycling in Cleveland. Um, and what we found out is that there are no like mandates for recycling in Cleveland. Um, 
So stores can kind of just do whatever they want. Um, and so we went to two malls, West Side Market and Beachwood Place. Um, and our goal there was to learn more about like the recycling programs that were already in place. Uh, so our main takeaways from that, um, as you can see, this um, one bin here is very misleading because all of the um, material that says recycling and compost and trash all goes into one bag. Um, <laughs> so that was kind of alarming. And then also um, our biggest takeaway was that uh, all of the vendors had very different perspectives on what they thought the recycling practices were. So each individual vendor gave us a different answer on what was being recycled. It's really just cardboard that's being recycled, but no one seemed to know that. 45 seconds. Um, so we successfully like contacted a lot of different malls, recycling centers, and gotten like information from a lot of people who are very knowledgeable of plastic film recycling. Um, so what we want to do moving forward is kind of answer the questions that we have left, which is about like how do you start a plastic film recycling program? You know, how does it work from the recyclers? Or side. Um, and we also have um, heard about some successful examples of that, so we're going to work on getting in contact with them and um, making better connections there. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of, oh, okay, in terms of feedback, um, I think we haven't done a ton of secondary re research since our application, so if we have any gaps in that knowledge, um, that would be nice to figure out. Um, We've made like a lot of contacts, um, and it's a little bit difficult to keep track of. So how can we get the most out of like the people that we are interacting with? And the last one, um, yeah, just like getting into making like an actual like relationship with malls and stuff has like been the management of the malls yeah. rather than the customers. Yeah, it's been pretty difficult. Thank you guys so much. Um, in terms of feedback, I would love um, to see more uh, quotes and specific things that you got from all of these meetings and all of this hands-on research that you guys have been doing, specific things that you pulled out of that research, um, things that are not only um, policies but part of their user journey. I think that's another element with your how can we state. Remember that a how can we statement should have a user in it. So I think as you guys continue researching, make sure you're diving into um, at defining who your user is. Um, and um, I think doing an empathy map would be super useful. Um, in terms of your question about, you know, you have all of these contexts, it's sort of hard to sort through who they are um, or maybe even sorting through all of the, once you talk to them, all of the, um, all the great quotes, insights that you're getting from them. I actually want to um, screen share maybe really quickly if this is going to work. Um, there's a link at the end of the call notes for a stakeholder matrix example. Um, and it might work for me to screen share very quickly. Um, so this is actually a great example of what we do for our scoping process. Um, it's not going to let me zoom in here. Um, wow, this is a very blurry photo. A matrix is a really great way of sort of filtering through all of that uh, primary research that you're doing. So on one axis is um, all of the different stakeholders that you're talking to. This was on so they had students, they had teachers, uh, they had school admins that they were talking to. Um, and then on the right is the type of research that you're getting. So are you getting a quote? Are you getting something that's sort of the hope and fear of that stakeholder? Are you getting stats from them? Or are there further questions to be asking them? Um, and then in the center is um, each a, a post-it that applies to that matrix. So it's a hope and fear from a student. It goes on that part of the matrix. And that's a really easy way to organize everything that you're doing. Um, and then from this matrix, you can actually take all these stickies off of this wonderfully organized board and start clustering them according to similar themes. You can form, um, you can label those clusters and form themes out of them. Um, and that's a really easy way to go directly from what your users are saying and the research that you're doing to themes and pulling themes out of your research. Oh, you're good. Uh. Anyone else? We've got about a minute left. Aileen, other thoughts? Rebecca, other thoughts?
I'm getting lost in the notes. Does that matrix at all help, or is that is that addressing your concern? Yes, I think okay. it's, yeah, we're having trouble organizing our thoughts, I think, so. Okay. okay. No, I, think... I would even say, this is Juliana from RPI. Um, I would even say if you don't want to go through like looking at the whole matrix of stakeholders, maybe developing a few questions that you need answered um, and then kind of going through your list of people and see who would probably best answer those questions um, and reach out to those contacts. That's great. Perfect. All right, we are going to move on to uh, Texas State. Round us out. Yeah, we can hear you. You're a little uh, echoey. Volume's okay? Uh, you might want to get a little closer to the microphone. It, feel, it feels sort of tinny. Um, and then we don't see any slides you're sharing yet either. Okay, so it's, this is a uh, team from Texas State. Uh, so we're doing merge. When I go real quick, like, so we have from the last, uh, from the identify, we come up with like three how can we questions, identify two, three. Uh, we're making an assumption based on our uh, uh, secondary, uh, secondary research, we kind of identify three opportunities, and then we kind of look the population in the same market area. And we think that the Texas State the student is like more. We do a 
saying research on use of generate artifacts to understand it, uh, what the life cycle is like, and how they utilize the recycling system. Uh, I'll take away if you're in a willing job, uh, but the recycling system. Um, or there's another group of students that don't know what it's like. They don't even, they're not a recycling type. Um, we do participatory research and um, to have more interaction, face the interaction with the user, understand their frustration, motivations, and goals. Um, to understand why they do what they do. And we have a participatory research on campus to help. So we work, uh, this is part, it's like a, it's like a four step process. So we ask them to um, choose an item that they um, consume, um, ask them to organize, uh, separate the items, ask them what is their source of influence, uh, and then what kind of information they need to decide they need to um, So our second way is like, uh, as you get source of influence, is like the people they surround with the family, friends, peers, uh, the community, and also the internet, usually shirts, uh, schools, and browsers. Um, and also, we use opportunity to uh, recruit user for our next stage, which is like reframe and prototype and testing. Um, so, based on our participatory research, um, we kind of identify two main groups of the user. We understand what kind of information they're looking for and um, what was the source of information. And we create an empathy map on three main groups of users that we uh, learned about. We kind of create a stakeholder map to understand how the system works, um, who has the power, who's organized with how they relate to each other. Uh, so there's a new key insight that we learned from um, the research is the inconvenience and accessibility. This is one of the key concerns. Uh, accessibility to the right information, the viability. It is the the the, the business side of recycling. There's no rebate. How to use the standard program. The feasibility of practicing recycling. A lot of people don't do it because it's required to system and equipment and the complexity of the the, the process, the recycling process, but because it requires a lot of effort and time, and then it becomes a frustration user. So that can help us to come up with a criteria for our prototype evaluation, uh, how to make um, it more easy to access uh, to a resource and facility, how to make it user-friendly, how can we simplify the process of the user, uh, how to be communicate, make call for action, how to make it expensive, how to uh, focus on consumer benefits and values, and how, how to make it viable. And our feedback question is, um, when we want to ask, like, uh, do we have any process and recycling data by region? Because when we localize a challenge, and uh, I don't know if you have any experience, like, about, like, uh, any, how can we identify companies to work with us? Um, and how do you, uh, you know, grab a standard business? Um, and how can we, uh, on the measure for success, or even anything like criteria for evaluation, any foreseen risk or thing that we should be aware of, and what's your thought on the themes that we're going to find out in And then there is any data and research that we, we miss in anything. So, yeah. Wait, okay. thank you guys so much. Um, totally appreciate all of the um different ways that you jumped into doing research these last couple of weeks love the user generated artifacts we've been talking a lot about as well as your tests and there's a cart going by um we've been talking a lot about this week we've been ross and i have been doing some workshops here about uh getting do data and not say data and um those user generated artifacts of taking photos of uh, going into dorm rooms and taking photos of those bins are a great example of getting do data instead of just asking people um, what, you know, do you recycle? How comfortable do you feel about recycling? You're actually getting those artifacts of, wow, there's actually nothing in this recycling bin or there's something in this recycling bin versus not. Um, that was great. Um, it seems like you guys are definitely pivoting away from um, HEB and the grocery store side of things into the on-campus stuff. I loved all of the, the testing that you're doing on campus, the um, user-generated artifacts on campus, and that stakeholder map is really strong. Um, I would just be aware if you are looking for other areas to explore, um, you can go back to and get more research on that HEB and the grocery store side of things. Um, we were excited by that research that you showed in your application, but if you are now focusing down to this campus side of things, I think that's fine. Just be explicit about it. Um, just so you know, what you call your measures of success are actually more um, actually design criteria. Um, so you can add measures of success if you want. Measures of success are more actual measurable things that you can do for the future. Um, not just uh, sort of goals and criteria that you want your ultimate um, idea to fulfill. Um, 
I had another thought that's um, escaping me right now. Oh, user journeys. Definitely dive into the user journey. I think you're um, attaching all of that amazing research to specific points in the journey of a student, um, I think will really help you identify those pain points and gain points um, to move forward with getting really specific how can we's about the student experience specifically. Uh, other people's thoughts before we wrap up. I, I would just say it to me too, it seemed very much like you were pivoting towards campus, which I think is fine. Um, if that's what you're looking to do, because other people are covering other other areas. Um, and I would just say, and this goes for everybody, that you're focusing in right now on, on individual users and specific users. And ultimately, I think it's going to go from the individual to the general, because I think what um, P&G and FFRG are looking for is some sort of a template that they can, um, that, that works for your specific instance, but that they can then use Everywhere, so everywhere. There's colleges everywhere that they're they're a great user of plastic film, and so that would be fine. Same with you know a little community, big communities, whatever. You're you're ultimately going to try to create something that's reproducible, that's scalable. Um, I saw one of your questions was if you if if we thought that Coke would be willing to work with you. Um, I don't know. That's a big corporation and it's a great initiative for them but um, I would say probably somewhere on their website there is probably somebody that has to do with sustainability and that would be the people to talk to I'll, I'll, I'll write, make myself a note and see if I can find them because I'm a great I'm a great Googler and digger of things so if I can't I'll let you know yeah all right thanks Aileen um, Awesome work, everyone. Um, I want to emphasize, um, please, please, please uh, continue to reach out to Ross and I if you want any feedback, but also really take advantage of Aileen. Uh, she's wonderful in offering to um, have check-in calls with you guys. There's only about a week and a half between now and the next call, uh, just because of the schedule on Tuesdays and Thursdays. So um, just be cognizant of the time that you have. Uh, these, this next week and a half is all about reframe, um, which is about a, a sense-making process. It's about making meaning out of all of this amazing work that you're doing. A lot of you guys have next steps to continue talking with people, which is great. Continue involving and having those conversations throughout the design process. Uh, but don't wait to start synthesis or wait to start reframe as you guys are doing that. Um, doing synthesis and reframe right now will give you a framework as you continue talking with people so that it's a lot easier to make sense out of those future conversations that you have. Um, There's some awesome um, resources that we've linked at the bottom of the doc and we'll continue slacking out all the resources that we have as well. Um, and get excited for reframe um, and for our CRIT. Again, CRIT means that the PNG and FFRG representatives will be on the call as well. And that's next to, or not next Tuesday, but the Tuesday after on October 15th um, at noon Eastern or 11 Central. Um, we'll stay on if anyone has any further questions, but reach out to us, reach out to Aileen. We're happy to have check-ins in between. If you just want a quick phone call, send us a quick thing to get feedback on. And we're gonna try to start asking some questions on Slack and get you guys talking between calls too. So thank you so much. Um, this is an awesome, awesome start. Uh, you guys have a lot of fodder to work with um, and a lot of things to make sense out of. So we're excited to see you in two weeks. Thanks all.